Hello Psych 100 General Psychology students. This is Larry Hatcher. We are in Unit 5. We're looking at Module 2, Anxiety Disorders. Uh, you've heard this before, but just so that we're clear, for those that are watching the online video of this lecture while you're watching it, should have in front of you the document that contains my blanked out lecture notes. To download this document, log in Canvas, go to Psych 100, go to Modules, and select the module that's headed P100 Unit 5 Module 2 Anxiety. Locate and open the document that's entitled P100 U5 Mod 2 Lecture Anxiety. Uh, this is saved as a Word doc as well as a PDF, although it has most of the lecture notes you'll need. I've blanked out some important terms at various places. By watching this video, you'll be able to fill in the missing words so you'll have a complete set of lecture notes for this module. And the module is Module 2, Anxiety Disorders. I'm actually going to draw on information from two chapters in our current unit. Current unit, Unit 5, the last unit of the semester, involves two chapters from Ettinger, his chapter on behavioral disorders and also his chapter on treatment of behavioral disorders. I'll be drawing on information from both of those chapters and adding some new information as well. Here's the outline of what I plan to cover in this video. For the most part, I'll be talking about anxiety disorders. Begin with definition, give us some examples of anxiety disorders, spend a fair amount of time talking about specific phobia. I'll talk about theories of what causes phobias, and I'll integrate some uh, information about treatment into this uh, module, into this lecture. I'll talk about behavioral therapies in general, and I'll talk about systematic desensitization in particular. Uh, in the end, I'll set up a video that I want you to watch, one of the crash course videos. This one's called Biomedical Treatments. I'll give you some notes to set that up so you'll be able to make more sense out of it, and I'll give you a couple of questions to have in mind as you watch that video. Let's begin with the big picture and where I usually like to begin, which is with definition. Uh, anxiety disorders, definition for anxiety disorders, they are Disorders in which anxiety is characteristic feature of the disorder or the avoidance of anxiety seems to motivate abnormal behavior. There's your first fill in the blank. Uh, avoidance of anxiety seems to motivate abnormal behavior. This latter characteristic is what observers sometimes notice. The individual that has the anxiety disorder knows that he or she has it. They feel anxious. Very often, people don't necessarily act like they're anxious, uh, but they might engage in strange behaviors that wouldn't make sense if you didn't know they had an anxiety disorder. Uh, they have a job where they ha their office is on the ninth floor of a building, and they walk up the stairs to the ninth floor of the building every day. Uh, they don't acknowledge to you the reason they're doing it. Uh, the reason that they're doing it is because they have an anxiety disorder, a phobia of, uh, uh, of closed-in places. They don't like the feeling of being closed in when they get on the elevator, and rather than deal with that, they engage in what would otherwise seem like a bizarre behavior of walking up nine flights of stairs. Uh, those are the characteristics of an anxiety disorder. Person is experiencing anxiety, or someone observing that individual sees them engage in what would otherwise seem like bizarre behavior. I'll give you a couple of examples of anxiety disorders. Common one is agoraphobia. Agoraphobia is characterized by an intense fear of being in places or situations from which escape might be difficult. Some people have fears of being in stores. They have fears of being in theaters and of other public places. Uh, that's what we associate with uh, agoraphobia. Fear of being in public places from which escape might be difficult. That's probably not the, the best stereotype example of a, an anxiety disorder. Probably the single be best stereotyped example of an anxiety disorder is this, specific phobia. Uh, definition for specific phobia. It's characterized by an intense paralyzing fear of some specific object, such as snakes or insects or bugs or dogs, 
or some specific situation. Some people are afraid of being in high places. Some people are afraid of darkness, of thunderstorms, of closed-in places, like the person with fear of getting on that elevator that I described a minute ago. Uh, Edinger talks about uh, specific phobias. He has an interesting table in which he provides the names for specific phobias. And no, you do not need to memorize these names. You won't be tested on them. Some of these are names that you have heard elsewhere in uh, popular culture, in the popular media. Some of them will be new to you. Many of you have heard this term before, acrophobia, fear of high places. You've heard of claustrophobia, fear of closed-in spaces. Uh, there are some disorders that are common, although we don't hear their name very often in popular culture. Things like uh, mysophobia, fear of contamination, uh, thanatophobia, fear of death, xenophobia, fear of strangers. Very often we hear the term xenophobia in political science talk. Very often we're talking about people that are afraid of foreigners, people from other countries. If you're talking about it in the clinical psychology sense, it is a fear of strangers in general. Uh, so those are some of the names for different kinds of specific phobias from which people may suffer. With most of the psychological disorders I lecture on, I like to give you a case study uh, that gives you a sense uh, up close and personal of what it might be like to have this disorder. Uh, in an abnormal psych textbook, I read up on the case study of someone that the author referred to as Judy R. Came in for therapy because of a fear of birds that she had had since she was nine years old. Came in for therapy at the age of 27. As is the case with a lot of people that have uh, anxiety disorders, didn't necessarily come in because she wanted to, but felt kind of forced to do so so that it wouldn't interfere with her career uh, for reasons that we'll see here in a second. A uh, little background, uh, Judy R. said that she suffered from phobia concerning birds, fear of birds. She reported that she had some, uh, had had some frightening experiences with birds when she was a kid. Uh, she, one time she was frightened by an owl near her home. She remembers her brother scaring her with a toy bird. She remembers being afraid when she saw Alfred Hitchcock's uh, film, The Birds. Here's a still from The Birds. Uh, this is the sequence where the crows are waiting outside the schoolhouse for school to be out and the kids to emerge from the schoolhouse. Uh, she remembers seeing that movie and she remembers being frightened by it, uh, but she didn't think that was why she had this phobia. She didn't attribute her current fear of birds to any of the above. She wasn't sure exactly why she had this phobia. Um, as the phobia got worse, she structured her life more and more to avoid any possible contact with birds. Uh, she didn't like to walk in areas that had trees. When she drove somewhere, she always had the windows rolled up all the way so that a bird could not fly into the car. Uh, toward the end, that is toward the end before she came in for therapy, when she parked her car, she would start running from the car to the building so that the birds didn't have any opportunity to swoop down and get her. When she was driving, she would be careful not to run over birds. She thought at some level maybe that would be a bad thing. The other birds would find out she'd run over a bird and they would come and get her. Now, she's not psychotic. She didn't really have this delusion. But at some gut level, she was afraid that something like that might happen. As is the case with a lot of people with anxiety disorders, she came in for therapy when it interfered with her career. In her case, it interfered with her plans to be a teacher. Uh, she panicked when a student in her class gave her a feather. She panicked when a student in her class brought in a baby chick on Animal Day. One day, uh, she was walking her students through a local museum, kind of herding the kids from room to room. At one point, she looked up and was horrified to see that she was in the bird section of the museum where she was surrounded by dead stuffed birds, gave her a panic attack. She realized she could not go on like this. She was going to have to do something about this fear of birds that she suffered from. Now, what was true of her is true of most folks that suffer from anxiety disorders. 
she recognized that her fear was irrational. She wasn't psychotic. She wasn't delusional. She didn't have some delusion that the birds were actually uh, going to gang up on her. She realized that these fears that she had, a lot of people would consider to be crazy. Uh, she didn't know why she felt this way. Some people with phobias do know uh, why they're behaving as they do. Uh, in many cases, they don't know what is going on that's causing them to behave in this crazy phobic way. And importantly, it limited her life. It prevented her from living her life the way that she wanted to live her life. That is why she came in for therapy. Uh, what causes phobias? Now, in truth, with a lot of psychological disorders that you'll read about in Ettinger, the psychological disorders that I will talk about, there is no consensus as to what causes them. A popular view about what causes phobias is a behavioral explanation. Uh, the behavioral explanation is phobias probably come about through the process of negative reinforcement. You remember back in Unit 2, you learned about positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement, and punishment. A lot of behavioral psychologists believe that phobias probably come about through negative reinforcement. It goes something like this. Let's imagine uh, you have an uncle who is frightened of dogs. He's not only frightened of big, mean dogs, like a big, mean Rottweiler that might kill him, but he's afraid of any kind of dog, a beagle that most people would not be afraid of. Uh, even Aunt Millie's little chihuahua dog he's terrified of. He won't go over and visit Aunt Millie because he's afraid of the dog. Uh, what might be responsible for this phobia? Now, here's one conjecture. Maybe when he was a kid, he had a bad experience with a dog, a legitimate bad experience. Uh, he was 10 years old, walking down his street. Uh, there are neighbors that own a German Shepherd dog that had a reputation for being mean. Sure enough, on this occasion, the dog uh, ran out, bit him on the leg. He had a bad experience with the dog. A few days later, he's walking down the street, and he remembers this bad experience he had with the German Shepherd. He lives in that house that's up ahead. I don't want to walk in front of that house again. The dog might come out and bite me. Uh, I think what I'll do is turn around and go the other way, and I'll walk a block out of my way in order to get to the place I want to get without having to go past that German Shepherd. What your uncle was doing at age 10 he was engaging in avoidance behavior. He was avoiding the thing uh, that had caused the unpleasant experience to begin with. Now, this may be a good thing, may be a bad thing. Most likely what happened to your uncle when he was 10 years old is he was reinforced for that avoidance behavior. He felt relieved when he made the decision to turn around and go in the opposite direction. Anxiety went away. Uh, uh, behavioral psychologists tell us that being able to avoid anxiety is one of the most powerful reinforcers there is. What your uncle experienced was negative reinforcement. You remember negative reinforcement occurs when you engage in some behavior. You're more likely to engage in some behavior because engaging that behavior allows you to escape from something unpleasant or avoid something unpleasant. Um, he walked the other way. He avoided going past that house. It caused his anxiety to go away, and because it was reinforced, remember that reinforced behaviors tend to reoccur. So, uh, two days later, when he has the opportunity to walk somewhere, he once again remembers the German Shepherd and avoids walking past that house. But the problem occurs when this avoidance behavior starts to generalize to additional situations. Uh, three days later, he's walking down another street. Uh, he knows that there's a family in a house up ahead that has a pit bull. He has never heard pit bull biting anybody. He's never heard of pit bull being mean to any, anyone. But he feels kind of anxious when he thinks about walking past that house. He decides, you know what? I'm not going to do it. He turns around, walks another direction. He goes two blocks out of his way so he can avoid going past the pit bull. A week later, he has the opportunity to walk past a house that has a beagle in it. Well, why take chances? Maybe that beagle is going to come out and bite me. I don't want to go through that again. So he avoids walking in front of the beagle. His world gets smaller and smaller, such that one of his prime uh, directives in life 
is avoid any kind of situation where there's a dog that might bite me. Uh, his avoidance behavior has generalized to other situations. The next thing you know, he refuses to go and visit Aunt Millie because Aunt Millie has a chihuahua and he will not have anything to do with dogs at all. At that point, a lot of folks would say your uncle has developed a specific phobia. And this case came about through negative reinforcement. Now, just as the behavioral psychologists have an explanation as to what maybe causes phobias, they have developed a number of therapies that are effective in treating phobias. Uh, one kind of psychotherapy that has been shown to be particularly effective in treating specific anxiety disorders is the family of behavior therapies. Uh, it's a family that has many members in general. Uh, behavior therapies are based on the assumption that maladaptive behavior has been learned and therefore it can be unlearned. Uh, uh, behavioral psychologists take the principles that were established by people like Ivan Pavlov and B.F. Skinner and they use those principles and apply them to real world problems to treat psychological disorders. Uh, those therapies are the behavior therapies. Uh, they include things like operant conditioning. Remember B.F. Skinner and his operant conditioning. When it's used to treat psychological disorders, it's sometimes called behavior modification. Uh, back in the 60s and 70s, it became cool to refer to it as the abbreviation B-Mod. Uh, this is behavior modification. B-Mod is a real-world application of operant conditioning. Uh, another example of behavioral therapy is systematic desensitization, which I'm going to talk about in some detail in a second. Another example of behavioral therapy is modeling. Uh, Ettinger talks about all of these approaches to treating psychological disorders. I want to take one of them and do kind of a deep dive on it. And the one that I'm going to talk about in some detail is systematic desensitization. It is a behavioral therapy. Uh, we're going to see that it's basically a real-world application of classical conditioning, uh, Pavlovian conditioning. Uh, systematic desensitization is a behavioral therapy that pairs slow systematic exposure to the anxiety-inducing situation with relaxation training. You remember that classical conditioning is all about pairing one stimulus with another stimulus. We're going to see that that's what systematic desensitization is about. Pairing slow systematic exposure to the anxiety inducing situation being paired with relaxation training. As I indicated, uh, systematic desensitization is based on the principles of classical conditioning, what Ettinger calls Pavlovian conditioning. Let's imagine that you have a severe phobia concerning snakes and you want to be treated for this phobia concerning snakes. Uh, let's say you're a young father and you've been afraid of snakes since you were a young kid and you didn't think much about it. But now you've got children. They like to go out camping. You don't want to go camping because you think there might be snakes out there. Eventually you decide, I'm not going to let this uh, direct my life anymore. I'm going to seek treatment for it. Find a behavioral therapist who says she's going to use systematic desensitization to treat your specific phobia of snakes. Um, systematic desensitization consists of a number of steps. It goes something like this. Step number one, develop a hierarchy of feared situations. Hierarchy is just a fancy word for ordered list. Uh, the psychologist says, well, the first thing we're going to do is put together a list of 15 or 20 different situations in which you are interacting with snakes. Now, some of these are going to be low in the hierarchy. They're going to be situations that you don't think would scare you very much. And some of them are going to be high in the hierarchy. They're going to be situations with snakes that you think will scare you a whole lot. So you spend some time putting together these scenarios of you interacting with snakes. Uh, next, she teaches you progressive relaxation. Uh, this is one of the most important tools in the tool chest of behavioral psychologists and other kinds of psychologists. Progressive relaxation can be done in a number of ways. One common way of doing it is you lay on a couch, dim the lights, or at least close your eyes. Uh, tighten the muscles in your feet. Clench them. Hold them tight for five seconds. And after five seconds, 
you release those muscles. And as you release them, you visually imagine the stress leaving that part of your body. Now, tinch the muscles in your lower legs, in your calves. Hold them tight for five seconds, then release those muscles. And as you release the muscles, imagine the stress in that part of your body, uh, leaving that part of your body. And you slowly work your way up your body, uh, doing this with the major muscle groups, with your thighs and with your forearms and with your upper arms and shoulders. And eventually you even do it with your face. Uh, it takes 5, 10, 15 minutes to go through this. But at the end of it, if you're like most people, you are totally relaxed. Now that you're in this state of relaxation, psychologist is ready to start doing the classical conditioning that we talked about a minute ago. We're going to pair this relaxed, uh, this relaxed state that you're in with an imagined scenario of your least feared situation of you interacting with snakes. While you're in this very relaxed state, psychologists guide you. Uh, I want you to imagine as vividly as you can the following. Uh, you're in your car, it's a bright sunny afternoon, you're driving down the road and you feel great. You notice on the side of the road, there's a harmless little green snake and you drive right past it. And that's fine, you can imagine that situation, you're still relaxed as you imagine that situation. Okay, good, let's start working our way up the hierarchy. Step four, work our way up the hierarchy. You're able to imagine that situation without being scared. How about this one? Uh, imagine vividly, you're walking through the woods. It's a bright sunny day. You're walking on a wide path. You notice on the side of the path, there's a harmless little green snake and you walk right past it. Well, that kind of scares you some. You're feeling anxious now and you signal it to the psychologist by raising your finger. She says, okay, get that image totally out of your mind. We're going to go back to our progressive relaxation thing. And she walks you through the progressive relaxation of tightening and loosening muscles in your body until you feel totally relaxed. And now you go back and imagine a scenario again. You meet once a week, twice a week, three times a week, doing this business of being relaxed and at the same time imagining one of your feared situation. As the sessions go by, you find you can go higher and higher up the hierarchy. Eventually, after some weeks of therapy, you're able to be relaxed while imagining a situation that weeks ago would have been horrifying to you. Uh, it's a dark night. You're walking on a trail by yourself. It's starting to rain. You need shelter and you see a farmhouse up ahead. You run up to the farmhouse, but you realize there's no lights on. Nobody lives here. It's deserted. Well, it's shelter anyhow. You go into the farmhouse and there's no lights, but you decide to sit on the floor until your eyes adjust. And as your eyes do adjust to the light, you think you see something moving over on the other side of the floor. And as your eyes adjust to the darkness, you recognize there is something moving over on the other side of this room. Uh, it's a snake. You stand up and you can see, oh my gosh, it's a poisonous snake. It's a rattlesnake. Uh, you step backwards to get away from the snake. The boards creak under your feet and they break and you fall through the floor into the cellar below. You find that in the cellar, it is filled with snakes, with rattlesnakes and copperheads. And they're very angry at you for having fallen on top of them. And they start biting at your legs and biting at your arms. And you open your mouth to scream in horror. And when you open your mouth to scream in horror, one of the snakes jumps into your mouth. And now it's inside your body, biting at your internal organs. And you're imagining this scenario. And weeks ago, this would have terrified you. But you're able to imagine this scenario while still being totally relaxed. You're in your relaxed state. Uh, you have developed the capacity to think about snakes, imagine yourself with snakes, while still being relaxed. 
Final step is the real test. Does this generalize to the real world? If your child brings a toy rubber snake up to you, are you able to reach out and take the snake without having a panic attack? Uh, if a friend has a terrarium and a harmless green snake inside it, are you able to go over and look at the terrarium and even put your hand on the terrarium without freaking out? If yes, those are the kinds of signs that it's successfully generalized to the real world. Now, if it doesn't generalize to the real world, the psychologist is not out of tricks. There's all kinds of other behavioral therapies that could be used in that situation. But I like to talk about that because it is a good example of a behavioral therapy, systematic desensitization, real world application of classical conditioning, Pavlovian conditioning used to treat anxiety disorders including things like specific phobia. And I make that notes more specifically down here at the bottom of the page. Systematic desensitization is a type of classical Pavlovian conditioning. Uh, when it's successful, you've been conditioned so that seeing a snake, which in this case has become a conditioned stimulus, will elicit feeling relaxed, which is your new conditioned response to that conditioned stimulus. When it works, this is the association that's been formed. Seeing a snake now elicits feeling relaxed rather than feeling scared as it did before. Now, that's an example of a behavioral therapy. I want the students in my class to watch a video that talks about additional approaches to psychotherapy. I want you to watch one of the videos from the Crash Course series. Uh, this video is called Biomedical Treatments. It's about 11 minutes long. I'm not going to show it in this video since I don't own the copyright to it, but I do have the link to it in the document that you're looking at. I like to show this video to class because it discusses different approaches for evaluating the effectiveness of therapies. It talks about the various characteristics of effective therapies. And as the name would suggest, it spends a fair amount of time talking about biomedical therapies, biomedical approaches to treating psychological disorders. Uh, drugs, medications like Prozac, uh, anti-convulsive or rather electroconvulsive therapy and such. Uh, there is a different video in the Crash Course series that covers other approaches to therapy, the talking psychotherapies and behavioral psychotherapies, uh, but I like my class to see this one because in some respects it covers the more important issue of how do you determine whether a given therapy is effective or not. Uh, in a minute, I'm going to give you some questions that I want you to have in mind as you watch the video. As is usually the case, you can assume there'll be one or two questions on the test based on my questions I'm about to provide. Uh, but before I give you the questions I want you to have in mind as you watch the video, I want to give you some notes and give you some setup for one of the topics that's discussed in this video. And that is electroconvulsive therapy. I want to say a few things about electroconvulsive therapy ECT before you watch the video. Um, some basics about electroconvulsive therapy. Electroconvulsive therapy has a long history. In decades past, it was used to treat things like schizophrenia, uh, disorders for which it is no longer used today. If electroconvulsive therapy is used today, it's typically used only with depression. And it's usually not the first approach that they use in treating depression. ECT is typically used in treating depression only if the depression is severe and if it has not responded to other types of therapy. Uh, most people that suffer from depression respond well to talking psychotherapy, things like cognitive therapy and other kinds of talking psychotherapies. Uh, in the short term, uh, it's not a, usually not a bad idea to be put on antidepressant medications. Some people may need to be on antidepressants for a long period of time, uh, but most people can benefit from it at least for a short period of time. So if you suffer from depression, there's a bunch of things that your therapist is going to go through before they consider ECT. But if it's severe depression, if it's not responding to the other approaches, and in particular, if the therapist is concerned that you might be at risk for suicide, then ECT is going to be one of the things that's considered. I wanted to say some things about ECT because it has kind of a negative reputation in the popular media that a lot of folks would argue is not really deserved. 
Many people have negative associations with electroconvulsive therapy. Uh, for a lot of us, our negative association with it comes from a movie from 1975, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Uh, there's a scene in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest in which J Jack Nicholson's character gets ECT. I got a couple of stills from the film. Um, Jack Nicholson's character was making problems for the staff at the psychiatric hospital where he found himself. Uh, they uh, put him in line with some other folks to get electroconvulsive therapy. Uh, it begins like this. They put a, uh, a bite plate in his mouth so that he won't break his teeth with the convulsions that are about to come. Uh, put electrodes on either side of his temples. Uh, shoot a jolt of electricity across his brain. He immediately goes in what appears to be pretty violent convulsions, shaking and such. Uh, for a lot of us, this was uh, the first and maybe the only exposure we got to ECT. So a lot of people came to think of it as being like torture, like punishment, uh, using electric shock in order to hurt somebody to punish them for misbehaving. Um, and back in the 1940s, 1950s, to some extent that reputation might have been deserved. Um, decades ago, when people got ECT, they would go into fairly violent convulsions, and there were occasions that people would convulse so violently they might break a bone. Uh, today, uh, folks that work in the area tell us that ECT doesn't look like that today. It's not performed in the same way shown in the film. Among other things, if you're going to have ECT, you'll be given some kind of a muscle relaxer so that you do not go into violent convulsions. Um, when they shoot the, the um, uh, surge of electricity across the brain, you don't experience pain. It's not like being given electric shock. Uh, you're immediately unconscious. You go into mild convulsions. Since you've taken muscle relaxer, uh, you'll kind of quiver some uh, on the gurney, but it's not the violent convulsions we saw in the film. Uh, so most experts in the area say that ECT really doesn't deserve the negative reputation that a lot of people associate with electroconvulsive therapy. I like to say that just to kind of set up the crash course video that I want my students to watch. As is always the case, there's a couple of questions I want you to have in mind as you watch the crash course video. Question one, according to this video, what type of investigation is the gold standard for evaluating the effectiveness of psychotherapy? Uh, I'd like to, I, you remember I began the semester talking about uh, experimentation, talking about research methods, uh, what kind of investigation gives us stronger evidence of cause and effect, what kind of investigation gives us weaker evidence of cause and effect. I like to kind of close the loop here at this point in the semester by talking about research that's conducted with uh, psychotherapies. According to the video, what kind of investigation is gold standard for evaluating whether a given type of therapy is effective or not? Question two pertains to the electroconvulsive therapy that I just spent the last five minutes talking about. Is electroconvulsive therapy, ECT, typically effective in treating severe depression? They talk about that in Crash Course video. What do they say? If you're looking at the document that I had you download from Canvas, there should be a link in that document. You can control click the link. It'll take you to the Crash Course video on YouTube and you can watch it for the purpose of answering my questions. Notice that these are a couple of blanks that I have left blank on my uh, lecture notes that you folks are looking at right now so that you'll have even more reason to watch the Crash Course video. Uh, watch the video, look for the answers. Most likely you'll get the answers. If you don't, you can ask me about them during the review session that we'll have uh, not terribly long before test number five. Uh, that's the end of my lecture notes for module two. Keep an eye out for emails from me where I'll be talking about the next activities, the next things that you can expect in our course.